on a pheasant hunting trip, December 8, 1945. He had just come back from the United States, and he told his wife, Dear, I don't think I'll be coming home. I think I'm going to die. Now, George, like, the war's over, dude. Like, you're, you're going to be good. Big new conspiracy based on a book that the Allied Command had Patton taken out because of the inflammatory things he was saying about the communists and the upcoming Cold War and rearming the Nazis to fight the Soviets and it just couldn't be had. So his car is struck. Um, his driver makes it out okay. A two and a half ton truck on the emergency brake supposedly lets go and his patent is going through an intersection. It hits him, breaks two vertebrae in his spinal column and he died of pneumonia December 21st, 1945 where he was buried in Luxembourg City. He is the very first grave as you come in the Battle of the Ballers um, the Cemetery, sitting out in front of, of his men. Um, I think he kind of would have liked to have been with them, but he's like 50 yards um, way out in front. But the interesting thing, as the train carrying his body winds through Belgium, France, Germany, and into Luxembourg City, Pretty much the entire way, at every town, people were out on a dark, rainy night. Every town the train passed through, the church bells rang, and even in Germany, they had a moment of silence. And when Patton was taken off the train and carried the two miles into the now American cemetery just outside the city, the whole street was lined um, with civilians. He'd become a European um, icon. Um, his armored warfare techniques are still being taught, and in a small microcosm, his lightning, no slow down, go as fast as you can techniques are taught by a lot of special operations forces. If you're going to hit a target, hit it fast, hit it hard, don't slow down. Know what's around you, know what your role is, but speed and surprise can make up for lack of firepower and or, or numbers. So his military legacy lives on. And he always said, he goes, it's not about just giving orders and leading men. He goes, it's transforming yourself into a symbol. Never ask your men to do something that you won't. Whether it's being up in front in World War I, or walking through the cold forest with them in the Battle of the Bulge, or riding in a tank, or sweating it out, um, in live fire in, in Sicily, Patton said, if they see me doing it, nobody will question why I'm having them do it. He remembers his days in World War I, where the officers never came to the front. It was not there. Um, they didn't see what was going on. Patton said, you can never say that um, about me. Um, whew, this, um, here's what I think is, is, is the biggest thing. Erwin Rommel, before his death, said Patton was the most brilliant commander of any army he had ever seen in the open field. He goes, in an open field, in equal numbers, nobody can match Patton. Adolf Hitler said he is the one name that struck terror into the hearts of my soldiers. He was the only guy that the Allies had who we were afraid of. Stalin, who hated Patton, and Patton hated him, says... No one could have done what Patton did in France. I don't have a single soldier in my army that could have done that. And Field Marshal Gerhard, uh, Gerhard von Rundstadt says, if you would have listened to him sooner, you would have won. We simply followed where he went because he was your best. And perhaps the highest praise will come from his old enemy, Bernard Law Montgomery, who said when it came to speed and aggression, he goes, nobody did it better than Patton. I disagree with his personality, and I disagree with a lot of his techniques, but what I can't disagree with is his results. He won. There's George Patton. All right. My God. Thank you. All right. It's 8 and 7 Holy cow. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Yes. Okay, back in 1918, you said he uh, he said it was right after the war was over, and it was the writing of the Treaty of, of Versailles and not physically defeating Germany. He's like, we must go into Germany 
and destroy some of their infrastructure. Show them what war is really like, or they're going to come back. Yes, sir. Who was his rank at the end of World War One? Captain. Who's captain? Oh, yes, sir. How did his um, you know, aggressive techniques compare to like Blitzkrieg? Almost the same. He was like, this is what we have to do. And he was pointing, look at what the Germans are doing in the Spanish Civil War. That's what we need. But everyone's like, no, George, you don't know what you're talking about. That is time. It's money. He's like, yeah, but it, but it works. He's one of those guys, kind of like pilot Billy Mitchell, who is so far, or James Longstreet from the Civil War, who is so far ahead of the game, no one else had their, their vision to see what was going on. And so it's almost too late. Yes, sir. Did he get credit or blame for Pearl Harbor then, since he was? He gets credit. Yeah, I mean, he gets credit. credit. Two, yeah, yeah, yeah. Two other um, Navy and an Army general go down in 1923, and they write almost exactly a duplicate of what Patton was saying. And 18 years later, you know, husband Kimmel and Maxwell Shorter, like, oh crap, maybe. Maybe we should have listened to the guys way back. And then it was almost to a T what the Patton and the other two guys said. So, um, you know, um, yes, sir. Did he stay captain all the way through to the world? You know, like, uh, like Eisenhower was a major all the way through. <laughs> he, um, he comes back and earns a major in, oh, uh, God, when did he become a major? Like 1929, 1930, and then has to wait up until World War II to get his um, generalship. Yes, sir. Any indication that Yamamoto used that as his plan to attack the Pearl Harbor? No, no, because um, it was, um, I mean, Yamamoto begins building that plan in 1930. He begins um, rehearsing. I think if you were any astute military observer, that's exactly what, 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 what you would have done. Patton wrote it down, and unless it got, you know, stolen somehow, but he gave it to his boss. It was like, this is trash, and shredded it. So, anyway. Um, all right. Um, boy, Chamberlain. You guys want to do Chamberlain or Dick Winters? Or try and do both? Oh, what do you want to do? I don't care. It's you guys, this is, this is your show. Dick, Dick Winters. Yeah, Dick you want to do Dick Winters? All right, we'll come back to my man, Chamberlain, <laughs> if we have time. All right. Chamberlain is, is just sad um, for me because his afterlife is just, while he becomes an icon in Maine, his family like falls apart because he's the man of Maine and he has so much attention on that. Um, uh, falls apart, oh, 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 where are we here? All right, we'll go back and get him. And if worst case scenario, I will videotape Chamberlain and put it out on YouTube if you want this article. I know it's better live than on videotape, but man, I am done like it for God's sake. So it's almost <laughs> like so, anyway, so, anyway, Nate's almost awake. You know what I mean? Is that the old feeling back, Nate? All right. um, Richard Winters, and if you've seen Band of Brothers, um, a lot of these things are in the miniseries. There's just a lot of idiosyncrasies that you don't know, just a truly humble, nice, smart guy. Uh, January 21st, 1918, Winters was born in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. His mom was a Mennonite. So he has this very strong, hard work ethic from a young age and very um, religious. Um, he loves sports. Um, football, basketball, and wrestling were his favorites. And he goes to college, he graduates um, uh, number one in his business college class, and at that time there was mandatory, mandatory military service. He so, said, you know, I've got a college degree, I'm going to go in and serve my one year. When it's over, I can go about, you know, not worrying about getting drafted, I can continue on with um, my life. While he's there, the war is going to um, break out. And so Pearl Harbor is bombed a few months after he, he joins the Army. So there he is. And he will be in South Carolina, and he'll wind up going to Officers Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia. And while there, he sees these new guys doing something, you know, wearing parachutes and doing all this physical activity. And he says, what are you guys doing? 
Well, we're trying to pioneer something called the paratroopers. Well, what is a paratrooper? Well, you're going to be a highly trained, heavily armed soldier who's going to jump out of an airplane behind enemy lines. Well, why in God's name would you do that? Well, it's to be you know, speed and, and, and aggressive, and we're all volunteers. We are the, the best of the best. It's a new mode of warfare. And looking around at some of his classmates, Winter said, that's what I decided I was going to do. And when Pearl Harbor is attacked, he goes, I want to be one of the best of the best. So he is one of the original officers of Easy Company of the 506th Airborne Division, 2nd Battalion, 101st Airborne. And here he is, young, you know, handsome Dick Winter's big guy. You know, about 6'3", 6'4", um, his big shoulders, really big, giant, like bear paw hands. It's a very soft, um, quiet voice. And Winters was one of those guys um, that was just mentally tough and always tried to find ways to do things better. Um, Camp Tacoa, Georgia, which is on like the Georgia-Alabama border, was chosen as the site to create an airborne unit. Um, the camp, when it opens, there were 500 officers who volunteered and 5,300 enlisted men. From that group, you can see the results. 148 officers and 1,800 men actually make it. Winters is one of the 148. And there he meets his antithesis, um, First Lieutenant Herbert Sobel, who was an accountant from Chicago. And Sobel was one of those guys who believed you led by being a bully or a tyrant. And you just beat down your officers to make them afraid of you. Problem with Sobel, different from Patton, is he never did anything with the men. He made them do it. He didn't run with them. He didn't march with them. He didn't work out with them. But he screamed and hollered at them. And one of the first tests come when there was a guy who later um, uh, uh, stays in the Army all the way and becomes a lieutenant colonel, a guy named Ted Christensen, who um, was on guard duty at night. And he was a 30 caliber machine gunner. And as he gets off guard duty, Easy Company on a Friday night was going on an 11-mile march in the rain. Well, they were told to fill their canteens and not drink out of them. Christensen could have let Easy Company march out, go back to the barracks and lay in rest while all of his buddies were out marching. But he ran back, put his machine gun down, grabbed his M1, and ran to catch up with them. What he didn't do was fill his canteen. And so when the march was over, Sobel shows up and makes each guy dump their canteen out. When Christensen gets up, he tries to explain, well, sir, I was on guard duty. Sobel cuts him off and says, what you need to do is not give me an excuse. You need to repeat all 11 miles of that march. People are like, oh my God, it's Christensen. And Christensen wasn't thinking about quitting, but Winters comes up, whispers in his ear, turns out he says, don't give him the satisfaction of making you quit. And Winters marches the 11 miles with it. So just the two of them go out. So Winters does 22, and all the men are like, oh, there's somebody that we understand. There's somebody that we respect. But it makes Sobel angry. And so this is portrayed famously in the miniseries where he has the men eat a bunch of spaghetti and tells them that they are going to get a day off. And to be the marionette that he is, he comes in and makes them run three miles up a mountain called Curry. As the guys are running, Sobel is there screaming at them, yelling at them. They're throwing up, they're barfing. Next man who throws up, um, I'm going to kick out of here. And all of a sudden, they begin to sing one of their marching songs. Now, Winters was told that he was going to be the head mess officer. That is an assignment you give somebody when they screw up, when they're not good at their tasks. It's a punishment. Well, Winters finished his kitchen duty, put on his workout gear, ran to catch up with the men, and led them in singing their little personal easy company chants. He did it to take the energy, the negative energy um, and bombasticness away from Sobel and redirect the men to bring them together, do something that they are all accustomed to so they can block out the noise that is, is Herbert Sobel. 
And it's those little things right there. They're not big. They're not giant. They're kind of subtle, but they work. And Sobel is slowly um, ostracized. And here is, um, well, here's Sobel um, right here. This is when they're at, at Camp Mac, all about 50 miles from what is today um, um, Fort Bragg. And this is the guys running down Curry. Sobel had them do it three or four times a week. Whenever they ran, whatever Winters was doing, he ran along with them, where you can see other guys are, you know, walking up and down the mountain. Easy Company was always running. And so what Sobel will do, and Winters will later say, is he melded us. If you've seen the movie Miracle, where the assistant coach and the doctor are in the car, they're going to get gas in one of the old 70s gas station lines, and he's like, have you ever seen Herb treat his players this way? And the doctor says, well, maybe if he makes them all hate him, they won't have time to hate each other. Anybody remember that scene? Okay. Well, that was kind of sobel. Everyone was so mad at him, they put their own differences aside, and they became a unit. And while he pushed them harder and longer than everybody else, they outperformed all other paratrooper units. So they, winners will always say that Sobel made easy company. He goes, I led them, but Sobel made us. And so um, the big uh, task comes, um, it is well known that Sobel couldn't read a map. And one of the things that winners would make um, his soldiers do is go out at night and everybody took turn leading the group with a compass and a map. When they were on those 11 mile marches, we don't know when one of us are going to hit. I may not be here. Your sergeant may get hit. Every one of you, we're paratroopers. We're going to be operating in the dark. I want you to be as comfortable in the dark as you are in the daytime. And as a result of the great performance, um, when they are with winners, and when they follow behind timetables when Sobel is leading them, Sobel will court-martial winners when they were in Adelborn, England, um, about you know, 20 miles west of um, what is today Stonehenge in Salisbury. And um, Sobel told winners to expect the latrines at 10 p.m. Well, at 9 o'clock, Colonel, Colonel Strayer, Colonel Robert Strayer, told Winters to censor the men's mail, which Winters does until 9.45. And then at 9.45, he goes to inspect the latrine, and Sobel is there. Winters, I told you to be here at 9.45. He's like, well, when did you tell me that? Well, I telephoned the family that you're quartering with. Winters is like, well, you couldn't because they don't have a telephone. Oh, well, see me for your punishment. And Sobel is going to court martial him, um, or he wants Winters to be restricted to base for 60 days. Winters says, I never left base, so I really didn't care, but it was the principle of the matter. So he says, Here you go, I'll we'll stand trial but by court martial. Unbeknownst to anyone, all of the sergeants in Easy Company resign. And this is also in, in the miniseries. But the penalty this close to um, D-Day, this is now March 1944, was they could be shot. Winters goes and tells them, guys, you cannot do this, all right? You're going to get yourselves busted. You're going to get sent to the brig. You might get shot. I can't allow you to do it. And they're like, the worst that could happen, Lieutenant Winters, is we get shot. It is better to be shot by an American than getting killed by a German in combat because we refused to let Herbert Sobel lead us in combat. Thirteen non-commissioned officers go to the colonel and turn in their stripes. Unprecedented. But if you talk to those guys, um, there's only a few still alive, they said that was our unwavering confidence in Richard Winters. We all went in there, not a man backed out, not a man shied away. One gets thrown out of the airborne, one gets busted back to private, but the message was loud and clear. Sobel is removed, and Winters takes over. Um, right before um, D-Day, uh, one of the things that, that they're doing is the paratroopers carried about 150 pounds of gear on them. 
Um, you know, it's the old Boy Scout mentality, have it not need it, they need it not have it. Well, he said if they would have done it again, all right, we know we would have traveled lighter. Weapons and ammo. We'll get food and we'll get water. But all that crap we had with us was just um, uh, ridiculous. And as they go out um, to get in their plane, Winters has a small prayer session with them. And what the guys said that impressed them the most is they were all laying on this hot tar tarmac with their body weight and gear. Winters helped every man up while wearing his gear and shook all of their hands and told them good luck. Everyone else was like, every man for himself, get your butt up in, in your plane. So Winters cared enough about us to help us up and say good luck and shake um, our hand. Um, as they land, um, everybody loses their gear. The British had this famous leg bag, which was attached to a cable inside their parachute pen. And it was a good idea. It's like an anchor. You jump out of your airplane. The leg bag drops. Where you land as you're taking off your chute, you got your equipment right there. It makes a lot of sense. Well, our pants didn't have the reinforced cable inside. And we were given leg bags to jump on D-Day. Brilliant America. So when our paratroopers jump out of the planes, the leg bag tears away. And all you have is whatever you're wearing. Winters had a knife on, on his shoulder. So he lands, and as they land, he finds a couple other paratroopers, and they were scared to death. And once again, he says, well, what are you afraid of? Well, we don't know where we are. He's like, well, yeah, you do. We're in Normandy. You studied the SAM tables, all right? You've memorized the map. Let's find out where we are and let's get moving. And they don't do a great job of this in the miniseries. By the time Winters makes it to his rally point, St. Marie du Mont, he's got 55 soldiers with him. In the miniseries, he's got like eight or 10 guys, and they shoot up those Germans underneath the bridge. That happened, but he had like 55 guys with him. He was kind of attracted little groups of men as they meandered along, and they got to their um, rally point. He's most famous for his attack on a place called Raycourt Manor, um, the little town of Le Grand Chemin. And if you go there today, you can still kind of see it. The owner of Raycourt Manor is an old man now. His name is Michael um, Raycourt. He was there um, during the attack. And what happens, we'll get back to Karen Tan here um, in, in, in a second. Um, here is um, Breakcore Manor, and what Winters does is Easy Company has 13 guys. That is the most that any company in the 101st Airborne had on D-Day, 13. Everyone else was scattered all over creation. So Winters is given the task of taking out four machine gun bunkers, or four um, artillery batters, 105 millimeter cannons, firing down Omaha or Utah Beach. They are guarded by three German machine guns. 65 Germans were in these machine guns or around these gun batteries in and along this hedgerow. And the only way to attack it is to go across this open field. And Winters is like, well, okay, I've got 13 guys. Uh, I don't know what we're facing, but these things are just blowing apart Utah Beach. So he comes up with an idea of attacking at multiple points. One up here, um, another one down here. Well, he led his men at about 120 yards across, well, it's actually it's up here, 120 yards across this field by these machine guns to gun pit number one. And what he does is he sends a few guys around here to throw hand grenades on this machine gun nest. And then his other machine guns, one here and one here, shoot at these guys. It's like, imagine a giant X. He and the rest of Easy Company run underneath that, right by these machine gunners to get into this trench system. He looked at it and said, there's really no good way to do this. Most of us aren't going to make it. But he had the, everyone so well oiled, the 
right as the hand grenades begin to explode right here, the machine guns open up and winners and six guys make it across the field. In a three hour running battle, they kill all six machine gunners and they capture all four gun emplacements while capturing 40 prisoners. One guy gets shot in the butt, a guy named Popeye Wynn, and another guy, um, Greg Hall from Abel Company, steps on a booby trap and, and dies. So 11 of the 13, yes sir? It takes three hours to, from the start of like... From, from the start in the, in the, the miniseries, that it takes like 10, it's three hours. Um, they said it was just constant chaos, confusion, running low on ammo, because more and more Germans kept coming out of the hedgerow. Like we would clear a gun and turn around, and oh crap, there are more Germans behind us. Eleven guys walk um, out of there, um, killing and capturing 60 Germans, and they silence all four of these guns. Should you ever get there, you can walk through the field and see where the guns are, and if you get up on a high point, you look right down onto Utah Beach. They would literally almost file parallel straight down um, Utah Beach. So those guns, um, when they are taken out by 9 o'clock on, on D-Day, save nu numerous lives. To this very day, that laying down the base of fire and, and shooting that X and moving your men underneath that, attacking from multiple points, is the way that soldiers at West Point today are taught to capture a fixed defensive emplacement. Something that winners drew up on the back of a K-ration wax box with a pencil in a barn um, out, so outside um, Braycourt Manor. Um, so, anyway. Um, uh, while he's there, once that is done, you would think, okay, my man gets a, a little break. So here are the machine gun pits. And they ran kind of diagonally across the widest part of the field to get down into this trench system, take out guns. One and two went pretty fast, but getting to three and four was just a vicious battle. So um, they had 11 guys, and all they had was rifles, rifles and hand grenades. Tommy guns and M1 rifles and hand grenades against machine guns, heavy equipment, and almost unlimited reinforcements from the German hedgerows that were back in there. Um, other things that um, Winters is, is going to help do, and whoa, I'm going the wrong way, uh, excuse me, um, is um, leading the attack on the village of Carentan. Um, once we got ashore, two of the things that soldiers didn't know about was we had trained to get onto the beach. What comes next? Easy Company is the first um, large unit to attack a large city called Carentan, where the German 6th Fallschirmjägers were hiding, German paratroopers. It is Winters and Easy Company of the three of Dog Fox and Easy Company sent to attack Carentan. Easy Company is the only one that makes it in. The German machine gunners were firing back and forth across this field. Dog and Fox Company stopped. They got shot to pieces. Winners leads Easy Company into the town. And Carentan is a, a pretty big town. On the spot, Winners talking with Lieutenants um, Harry Welsh and First Sergeant Cardwood Lipton, they begin to develop the house to house fighting doctrine that the rest of the Army will use throughout Normandy. Throw a couple of hand grenades through a window, wait till they explode, kick in the door, and shoot anything that moves. They come up with it um, on their own. Um, very, as soon as Carentan is taken, they are sent out into the hedgerows. And Easy Company is one of the first units to begin to work with the tankers. You know, we are going to you know, fight in the hedgerow here. You lob a couple shells into it, keep the Germans pinned down, and let us attack across the open field. Many of these things are developed and written down by Dick Winters and, and his men. And so the miniseries, and that whole story, if you don't know what, what that one is, um, Tom Hanks, why Tom Hanks is flying commercial, I don't know. If I'm a multi-academy award winner, like, you know, someone's gonna rustle me up a plane and I'm gonna get to where I'm going. But he, he's at LAX, 
and his plane is delayed. And he literally goes into a Barnes and Noble and he's looking around and wants to buy a book and yeah, this one's kind of, I got an hour and a half, I'll pull this one. He sits down in the store and begins to read it. Well, according to him, um, his plane left, you know, and he missed the next connection and he pulls out his phone and goes, hey, Stephen, I'm reading this book. This is awesome. We got to make a movie about it. And Spielberg says, well, what are you doing? He's like, well, I kind of missed my plane. Well, why don't you come over now and let's have dinner. Hanks drives to Spielberg's house. They sit down. They had just made Saving Private Ryan. They look at Stephen Ambrose's book, Band of Brothers, and says, man, this is freaking awesome. But it's too big for a movie. Why don't we make a miniseries? They call Stephen Ambrose, and he says, well, let me call Dick. We'll see what he wants to do. Stephen Ambrose in New Orleans calls Richard Winters in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and two days later they're sitting down to map out the um, miniseries. That's how it, it, it all comes down. And when you, if you haven't read the book, Easy Company is just, for whatever reason, they're the first to do so many things. You know, into Normandy, and into Carantan, and into the Hedgerows, and into Market Garden, and finding the first um, a concentration camp. They're there um, the whole way. The biggest thing that Winters did was in Holland, outside the town of Eindhoven, they were kind of on the, the far edge as the rest of the army was retreating, the Guards Armored Division. Easy Company is by this wide canal. And there's a long vertical like road embankment. And then running off of it in little cubes were smaller fields. And at the upper left-hand corner uh, is, was a large you know, part of the river and the lake. Go on in, sir. And a, a ferry. And what nobody knew was that the SS was coming across this canal on a ferry. And they were going to attack um, battalion headquarters one night. And Winters sends a patrol out, the only guy to send a patrol out, and a couple of his guys get shot and wounded. So he takes seven men, they go out, and they find the Germans setting up a four-barreled um, MG-42 machine gun, and they're firing down the road to headquarters. Well, Winters and his guys shoot and kill them, and all of a sudden, they start getting shot at from every direction possible. They slide down the embankment and they hide in a ditch in the middle of, of a field. And they're calling for reinforcements and calling for reinforcements. But they can't get anybody on the radio, so they have to send a runner back. By the time reinforcements come, daylight is breaking. And Winters reads the map. And he sees we've got a problem. He says, the Germans are on a 12-foot road embankment here. There is an 8-foot road embankment there, and there is a giant river with a ferry crossing. We're in the middle of a field lying in a ditch. So if we don't attack them, all anybody has to do is pop their head up, and we're surrounded. We're killed and we're captured. He had 28 men with him. So this is what we're going to do, guys. I'm going to take off, and I'm going to throw a smoke grenade. When it starts smoking, you guys follow me. I should be well ahead of you. If I get up there and I get shot to pieces, I want you guys to turn around and get out of here. Well, Lieutenant Winters, well, my God, if you get killed, he's like, no, 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 no. We have no idea what we are facing. Now, Winters was a, a heck of a runner. He takes off, throws the smoke grenade over his shoulder, and he said his adrenaline was pumping. He doesn't remember his feet hitting the ground. And he runs up the embankment, and he is staring right at 300 Waffen SS officers. Oh. And he goes, I thought it was like an old like cowboy western, who draws first. He goes, I dropped my rifle at the hip and just started shooting. Boom, 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 boom. His men claim that he got through three clips by the time they got there. He got through 24 shots shooting Germans who by this time are rallying. Another hundred come over one of the side embankments from the other side, and there's this gun battle between 28 men from Easy Company and 450 German soldiers. 
Because winners trapped them down in the gully, they only had so much mobility, and 300 of the 450 will be killed, captured, or wounded. 150 get away. His men said that was the point that they were in the most awe of winners. He said how he crossed the field that far ahead of us, stood there by himself, would have been very easy to drop down, to turn around and run, but he faced down all of those German soldiers. He lost one man, a guy named Philip Dukeman. Everybody else was pretty much um, um, unfazed. At that point, he is promoted um, to um, captain, and he will serve as an administrator. Those are the last shots that he fires in, um, in, in combat. Um, uh, when they get to Foy in the Battle of the Bulge, they said in the coldest of nights, when they were the hungriest and the coldest, winners would just show up. Even though he was a headquarters officer, supposed to be far and removed, he would sit up, you know, hey, Ken, you know, tell me about, you know, life back home. What's going on in um, Chapel Hill? Is Ann Connor going to Swanee? What's going on? Nate, what's going on up there in, in Charlottesville? And they said, whenever you were at your breaking point, when you were cold or lonely, winners would show up. He had this uncanny knack of knowing who needed to have. He goes, well, I wasn't much older than them. I felt like I was their, um, their dad. And they said it was his leadership and taking care of his guys. They ate, then he ate. Um, when hot food or warm clothes came up, winners made sure the men um, got it um, first. And he holds them together at Bastogne and through this ugly attack on Foy, I'll tell you about in, in a second. They said the second best thing that he did besides the battle um, in outside Eindhoven, is near the end of the war inside Germany, um, Colonel Sink is basking in the exploits of 101st Airborne. And they need intelligence. There is a small river outside the village of, of Hagenau. And guys were sent across this swollen, frozen river, and six little rubber rafts had to be pulled on a rope and they were supposed to capture a prisoner. Well, Easy Company goes out. They don't get a prisoner. They get three. Two of them were officers. On the way back, all hell breaks loose, and the Germans are shooting everywhere, and the guys are falling in the river, and they're freezing. And who shows up firing a 30 caliber machine gun but Richard Winters himself? The guys are pulled out. Colonel Singh is extremely happy. He tells General Bradley and Maxwell Taylor, look what my boys did. We didn't get one prisoner. We got three. That's how we do it in the paratroopers. And everyone was so excited. They go, winners, your boys were so good. Why don't you lead another raid? He's like, what? What for? The war is winding down. This is unnecessary. And he knew his men had been on the front line since they jumped in to uh, Market Garden on September 17th. They got like a two-day break at Morbillon when they found out all of their personal equipment and um, souvenirs and back pay were stolen and then sent right into the bulge. So Winters orders the men to stand down. He could have been arrested for this. He could have been court-martialed for this. But he writes up a fake report and tells Gen his General Maxwell Taylor and Colonel Sink, yeah, my guys went over last night, and we didn't see a darn thing. Sorry about that. Sink, they don't show this in the miniseries, didn't quite believe it. He goes around and asks all the guys, even the new replacements, did you guys go over? Oh, yeah. Man, you know, you know, Major Winter sent us over, and we didn't see a gosh darn thing. Once again, complete solidarity behind their leader because he did the um, right thing. Um, he, Easy Company finds the first concentration camp um, just, you know, inside Germany at a place called um, Ordorf. Um, when he finds it, he radios back. They ask him to explain it. He goes, I can't. You will not understand what I am seeing. The next day, Generals Patton, Bradley, and Eisenhower show up. Very soon after that, Dachau and other concentration camps are located, but Easy Company finds 
the very first one. Um, winners brings in medics, and they kind of show this in, in the mini series. Everyone's going to get food and water and bread, and Winter says, well, let's get some, some you know, medical treatment in here. And they find out horribly that you can't feed these guys because they'll eat themselves to death. Had Winters not called for the medics, everyone thinking they were helping out would have brought food and clothing and water. And who knows how many of those poor people um, would have died once they thought um, they were safe. His men make it into Birch's Garden, Eagle's Nest where he tells them to steal anything that is not screwed down. Uh, he himself will take two complete play settings of um, silverware and plateware from coffee cups to salad bowls to plates stenciled with A.H. And I asked him about this. I said, those were Adolf Hitler's. He's like, yeah. He goes, every Christian and Jewish holiday, he and his wife Adolf. And I go, but wouldn't they have Hitler cooties on them? I mean, you can like dishwash them and you can light them on fire, but man, he's like, oh, you know, I didn't think about that. I thought it was a great, the heck with you, Hitler, um, because look what I'm doing with your stuff. So that's the only thing he took. But they find uh, Herman Goering's wine cellar, and he will order seven deuce and a half trucks filled with all the liquor the guys could carry. He has them hidden, and then he lets his good buddy Lewis Nixon go in and take what, whatever he wants, and he breaks Easy Company up into seven groups. Six groups were working for three or four days, while the seventh group got to drink as much alcohol as they could hold. He goes, I figured they would do it anyway. Some of them deserved it. Winters was a teetotaler. He, he never drank. He's like, if I can control it and give them two or three days, it'll get it out of their system, and we can get back to work. He does an incredible job of during occupation when accidents were happening to find safe assignments for the guys who he had been with back in 1942, to send them to other parts of Europe where they would not get hurt and or injured. And he figured that his intelligence and the way he led men was so good he volunteers to go to um, Japan. This is them fighting in um, Carentan. It's a complete mess by the time they are done. And this is Easy Company getting the second bridge um, in, in Eindhoven. And the problem with the Norman towns is they're all made of, of granite. So every narrow alleyway, every window is a veritable defensive fortress. And he goes, the only way to do it, a la Patton, is with speed. You can't wait and slug it out. You have to be aggressive. Dog and Fox companies will be whittled to the bone. Easy Company carries the day in Carentan um, because of that. This is um, Ordorf, and here's um, Patton. Here's Bradley um, and Eisenhower. I uh, don't know, Winters, I don't know if he's in this picture, but this is the um, Burgermeister. This is the um, mayor who will, after this will go home and he and his wife will hang themselves um, after saying they didn't know what was going on out there um, at Ordorf, which I think is a bunch of crap. These are the original members of Easy Company going back to 1942. They are sitting on Hitler's patio in the Eagle's Nest. Here is um, Dick right here, and they got the champagne. And he said it was a private little party with the guys that he had known for um, three years hanging up there in um, Burgess Garden. After World War II, uh, um, you know, his life um, continues. He goes to work for his buddy Lewis Nixon um, at the Nixon Nitration Networks. And then he invents a hoof and mouth vaccine for pigs, horses, and cows. And he really liked um, Milton Hershey, who opened a boys' orphanage in Hershey, Pennsylvania, near where Winters grew up. So he goes to Hershey and says, hey, can I mix my vaccine in with your old chocolate? They form a good relationship, and Winters becomes a um, oh, kind of a veterinarian a millionaire selling his vaccine throughout the United States. And in 1951, 
He's recalled to active duty to go to Korea, something he didn't want to do. But he shows up, and he goes. He goes at first to talk to General Anthony McAuliffe, whom he knew from Bastogne. He says, Anthony, I'm done, man. Like, I put in my time. You know, no, no offense, but I'm starting a business. I'm having a baby. And McAuliffe says, Winters, I'd love not to, to send you, but you're one of the guys I handpicked. I, I can't do this without you. General Taylor is leading the charge into Korea. You have to go. He says, oh, okay. Um, I, I will go. But in Seattle, he notices the new paratroopers he's training don't have the discipline and the, the fortitude that his easy company guys have. So Winter says, the heck with this. And he decides to volunteer for the um, Army Rangers. And he's in back in Seattle getting ready to be sent um, over to Korea when a letter comes out. And the letter says, if you've got so many points, you can, you can leave. You don't have to go. But it was an absurd number. Points for days of service, days in combat, medals that you have. And Winters is like, oh, I got this. I mean, this isn't even going to be hard. And he goes to his general's um, office, and he turns in the paper and says, hey, you know, I'm Major Winters. Um, I've got the required points. I would like to muster out and go home. And the general, who was a younger guy, says, you're a coward. Winters says, what? You know, you're trying to duck your duty. You're trying to go AWOL. Lock him in the brig. And Winters is like, no, no, no. You can call and check on this. Oh, don't worry, soldier. I'm, I will. Eight hours later, the general shows up and says, Major Winters, I am supposed to personally apologize to you. I am to take and buy you dinner. And then I am to put you on a plane headed for Newark, New Jersey, where there is a car waiting to take you um, home. Once again, sir, you have my deepest apologies. And Winters is like, Dude, whatever, just get me the plane. I want to get the heck out of here. And getting on the plane, he goes, General, no offense, but a couple hours ago, you called me a coward, which really makes me angry. What made you change your mind? And he goes, this letter. And he pulls the letter out, and it said, you will immediately go to Colonel Winters. You will apologize directly to him. You will offer to buy him dinner. You will put him on a plane, and you will have a car ready for him. If this does not happen, you will answer directly to me. Who signed that letter? Well, President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower. So that's the kind of pool that um, winners um, had. Oh, shoot, it's up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, so anyway. Um, Winters, um, when his business takes off, will devote a lot of time to veterans affairs, to trying to make the lives of veterans better. Um, it is because of this that Stephen Ambrose, who writing his book D-Day, kept hearing this name Winters. Well, you got to talk to Dick. you got to talk to Dick. So finally he tracks Winters down, and they become very good friends. Winter says on D-Day, he went off for a little reflection time by himself and almost stumbles into um, German territory as he watched 200 Germans um, march by. And he says, um, I thank God for helping me survive D-Day. I asked him to help me live through the next one. I said, if I ever, ever get out of this, I want to buy a quiet little...